Okay, so next, in order to, so having assumed that we have a spectrum, the next thing we need to do is try to understand the spectrum. Uh, and this leads me to start thinking about finite volume effects. Finally, yay. Okay, so remember, I'm gonna be pretty um, simplistic here, right? At, you know, our calculations are performed in a finite mesh, right? And I'm just gonna assume that mesh doesn't appear. Okay, meaning I'm gonna assume the continuum limit of the theory, but I'm still in a box. And so the question is, you know, how does the spectrum that I obtain depend on this box, right? And because I'm interested in uh, IR physics, right, low energy physics, then this is expected to be the dominant effect, which is why I'm gonna expect, spend so much time thinking about it. Okay, so I'm gonna think about qubit boxes that are periodic, and so that's, you know, leads me to think about how, you know, what happens to the momenta, just to remind you, right, if I have a field that is periodic, um, this leads to discrete momenta. You know, if I have, if I make that, you know, consider a wave function that is a plane wave, um, then this is how it depends both on space and time, uh, space and the momenta, right? By requiring that the plane wave is symmetric, uh, it is um, invariant under um, shifts by L, meaning it's periodic, right? This tells me that this has to be equal to this, right? Which tells me that P times L has to be equal to two pi times some integer. It could be zero, one, two, etc. right? So N is some, some integer. In three dimensions, right? This is the same story, except um, you just have a three dimensional discrete integer, right? So, uh, you have a p vector is equal to 2 pi over l times some integer triplet where n is nx and y and z each one of which can go have magnitude and you know, it could be 0 1 minus 1 2 minus 2 etc right uh, and so this leads to uh, a you know having discrete momenta in this form right tells me that, you know, integrals over momenta have to be replaced with sums where the measure, of course, gets, um, you know, becomes explicitly dependent in, in, in the volume, right? Because the, here what I have is the discrete separation between all points in all, all momenta is defined by basically the smallest value that P can take the smallest steps that the, the momenta can take is two pi over L. And so I have that for for each direction, and so the two pi's cancel, right? I get two pi's canceling. I have one over L for each uh, direction, so I'm left with one over L cubed, and then I'm summing over discrete momenta. And so this. Um, this in conjunction with the fact that the, the Lagrangian density of any theory is volume independent, this tells me that all finite volume effects are hidden inside of loops. So where can I have finite volume effects? It can only come from the fact that I'm anywhere where I have a, an integral over three dimensional momenta that gets replaced with a uh, sum over discrete momenta with a prefactor that is uh, depends on the volume. Okay, and so the loops, like the bubble loop that we considered, which is going to play an important role, right? This was a four-dimensional integral over the kernels and then the propagator. Right, I have the squared and the squared. I'm just being a little sloppy because I have two vertices and you know two propagators they weren't exactly the same but I'm just like shoving on the rug the the dependence on the momenta right well this gets now replaced with a finite volume loop where um, the discrete momenta the, mo the spatial momenta get discretized and they're summed over uh, 
while the the zero components are continuous okay so that doesn't change the pattern, the fact that i'm in a finite spatial box only affects the the spatial momentum okay and i'm going to assume that some poor extent is sufficiently long that you know those that momentum doesn't get discretized and if it and if it gets discretized those effects are are uh subleading so okay so basically his idea uh, one thing that i'm sweeping under the rug here in the sketchy derivation is that this k actually becomes l dependent too but we're gonna i'm gonna argue that these l dependencies are exponentially suppressed which are the kinds of effects that i'm gonna neglect and so um most quantities that one encounters depends exponentially with the volume so in particular simple observables key emphasis on simple of single particle states okay have the general form that the observable that we're after i is equal to the infinite volume one up to corrections that go like e to the minus ml and what m does this you know what m appears here in uh in qcd because here i'm just being generic about generic field theories where i only have one mass m right well what m appears here uh the m that appears is that of the lightest degree of freedom of the theory which is m pi okay um why this is the case why don't you ask me and we'll talk about it how about that so this i is a generic ex uh, observable that has to be simple which i'm being vague by but basically masses foreign factors things like that they all behave like this okay and so here's a warm and fuzzy uh example basically you know if you have a single particle and it's in inside of a box and that box is sufficiently big then the sufficient big compared to the radius of the of the particle then it won't feel the boundary conditions and so all the observables will be independent of that and the and the size of the particle is is always in, in in qcd in qcd um is dictated by the the pi on mass because you have virtual pi ions that are being created all the time and and the how far these these pions these virtual pions can travel is uh inversely proportional to its mass to the mass that's one warm and fuzzy explanation why another warm and fuzzy is uh, if i think about the nuclear mass right and i put a nuclear inside of a box then um and the box is periodic which is all we care about right the the fact that this is not in an infinite volume or the the nucleon only knows that it's not in an infinite volume because it sees this mirror image okay it's interacting with this mirror image and how does it interact with this mirror image well the long range tail of the nuclear potential we don't know what the nuclear potential is in general but we do know that the long range part is due to the pine exchange so it's a yukawa potential and and so it behaves like uh an exponential with the um with the the mass of the exchange particle there and so uh since these particles are separated by a distance l then the shift in the mass the shift in the mass of the the one particle due to being in a finite volume which is due to the, is due to the interactions that it is experiencing with particles far away uh and that or by particles that are l away the closest one is going to be l away then the shift is going to be essentially that it's going to be proportional to that yukawa interaction okay so it's going to go like e to the minus l and pi um 
so that's basically you know that gives you a sense that this makes sense that you know that all the errors that one observes due to mirror images or due to being in a finite box um, for at least simple particle single particle states goes exponentially the way that you would derive this in field theory beyond just a warm and fussy derivation is you would just consider the observable that you want right define it in an infinite volume right once you start going high enough that you start getting loops right then you would have to do the same thing in a finite volume and evaluate the differences between those and that gives you a sense of the size of the error that you're making okay and so for example the mass of a particle let's the mass of a particle in some theory, like phi cubed, right? Um, well, I can identify the mass of uh, uh, particles from the poles of propagators. And so if I just look at the poles and the, the propagators in a finite volume versus an infinite volume, right? I just write out the finite volume propagator, fully dressed propagator in this phi cubed theory where I have a propagator then uh, phi, you know, couples to two phi's, and then they recombine, etc. Right. So I have a bunch of diagrams. I'm just drawing the simplest, the first contribution, and this looks like the bubble diagram, which I know and love by now. So that's why I'm paying close attention to it. That's why I picked phi cubed. Well, and then I'm subtracting the same thing in an infinite volume, right? This, the propagator, the leading order propagator, doesn't know anything about the box, right? except the momentum is discrete, but that's the same for this guy and this guy. So that piece cancels. And so the first contribution is, is indeed from the loops, right? Um, and so you can just write this down, right? You can just write down this propagator, the, this diagram and evaluate the loop in a finite volume versus an infinite volume and just see what you get, okay? Uh, you can use a lot of like tricks. I'll show you some of them. So why don't we just skip ahead, but let me just push through. Okay. So if I define the momentum to be flowing to be P, right? If I'm in the vicinity of a single particle pole, which is what I would want if I want to get the mass P squared, is going to be below two particle threshold. And so that means that these intermediate states cannot go on shell. Because they can't go on shell, they're just short distance fluctuations. They're quantum fluctuations, right? And so because they can't go on shell, they're never going to travel, right? So they're just short distance fluctuations. And so they can't sample the boundaries of your box. And so they should not give you large volume dependence. Okay, and this is important to contrast, right, with the fact that in this case, in the infinite volume loop, same thing. If I'm in this same kinematic region, the intermediate particles cannot go on shell. Again, they're just short distance fluctuations, and as a result, they can't lead to sing they can't result in singularities, right? The finite volume effects that are power law are just in contrast to exponentials. They're just really manifestations of finite volume singularities. Okay. So I can stop waving my hands as much, right? And then I can just write down this Feynman diagram and then this Feynman diagram. They're the same, right? They're the same loop, right? The coefficients. Here I just wrote the couplings for this five, five cubed as G, right? So I have I, G squared. Oh, I should have factors of two. Thankfully, you were screaming and telling me to have a factor of two from symmetry. You know, the fact that these are identical particles, right? Thank you very much for saying that. Appreciate it. Uh, okay. So then uh, the, inf the, the zero component integral is the same for the two. Then I have the sum over discrete momenta minus the integral for this guy, right? Discrete momenta, continuous momenta, right? Uh, and we did this integral, right? Like we, we, we've already done this integral where I did the K0 integral, right? We had a term like this, 
which was the most singular one, right? That's the one that led to the the cut, the face base cut for the infinite volume, the scattering amplitude. And so let me just isolate that guy, okay? Plus the other piece, dot, 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 okay? And then you can, in fact, uh, you don't have to actually neglect this here in this example, but it's just reminding you that, you know, if there's going to be some large finite volume effects, it's going to come from this guy, okay? Um, but then I can apply the Poisson summation formula uh, to rewrite this, this sum in terms of uh, integrals this the sum over momenta you can write it in terms of sums of integrals and the Poisson summation formula for this guy starts it, it basically allows you to write the sum, sum over different integrals with just a phase factor that depends on n and k okay but the n would include all possible integer triplets. If I set n equals to zero, that coincides with the infinite volume loop. And so the difference between this and this just results in that this sum does not include the n equals zero term, okay? Um, and in fact, you know, these kinds of integrals you can rewrite uh, many different ways. They tend to be related to Bessel functions, which, um, modified Bessel functions, which in the large L limit, they all can be approximated with um, exponentials. You can also just evaluate these integrals. You can, you know, rewrite this in terms of center and mass coordinates by noticing that, that this, well, it's a little trickier when you do it when you're in moving frames. If you set the total momentum to be zero, then uh, the only angular dependence is here so that you can do the angular piece relatively easily and then you're left with a, a single integral which you can evaluate um, numerically. Also you could have left things uh, covariantly by not splitting up the, the propagators and so then that you can evaluate using a combination of Feynman tricks and uh, the Stringer tricks for evaluating integrals and it ends up reducing to a single one-dimensional integral and and you could basically verify exponentially you know, verify numerically that this coincides with exponentials but the gist is that these are lead to uh, exponentially suppressed effects because the intermediate particles cannot go on show okay and we're I'm um, just gonna skip all, I'm gonna neglect anywhere where there can be exponentially small effects, which tr means really that I'm gonna be considering ML to be very sufficiently large that I can reliably ignore these kinds of effects, okay? So that means that ML has to be in the order of four or bigger, okay? And so, this allows me to ignore finite volume effects from one particle with reducible diagrams, like this one for the single particle states, uh, for the single particle propagator, that would be equal to infinite volume one plus corrections, tadpole diagrams, same thing. Uh, and so I'm just gonna assume that the infinite, the finite volume mass is equal to the infinite volume one because I'm, I'm neglecting these kinds of corrections, okay? The other place where this is important is in the types of diagrams that appear in the beta Peter kernel, where you can have exchanges like this, T-channel exchanges. Uh, well, again, if I'm in this kinematic region between the three particle and the two particle uh, thresholds, then you can see that here, as I mentioned before, you need, uh, this will, lead to off shells this will only have off shell intermediate particles exchange up into the four particle threshold right because i would have i need enough energy to put these four lines on shell simultaneously 
And so this is equal to the infinite only one plus exponentially suppress effects. Same thing in this guy, right? It's all the same story, right? It's a, you know the reason why these kernel these diagrams that contribute to the kernels were not singular is because the particles couldn't go on shell, right? That's what can lead to singularities and to imaginary contributions to observables. Well, in the finite volume world, if the intermediate particles can't go on shell, that just leads to uh, exponentially suppressed effects, right? Because the the intermediate particles are uh, uh, they're they're virtual particles, so they're not going to sample your boundaries or your box. That's the basic idea. And so you can just prove this essentially via exhaustion, um, but that's the simplest way to prove it. So this means that the the finite volume kernel okay here i'm putting the l explicitly okay is equal i'm going to assume is equal to the infinite volume one up to corrections that i'm just going to neglect all right so that's that's our working assumption uh and this brings me to trying to understand the two particle spectrum so what i'll do is that i'll start this um and I probably won't get all the way through, but then we'll, we'll stop it at some point, okay? So, so this is all the building blocks that we need to evaluate the, the relationship between the spectrum and the scattering output dude. So um, one important thing that I kind of overlooked, right, is to emphasize that the spectrum is time independent, okay? This may sound trivial and to some extent it is, but it is useful to keep in mind. This means that, you know, the spectrum that we obtain, um, you know, we can obtain, we can obtain the spectrum in many different ways, right? We can obtain the spectrum of a theory using the time dependence of Euclidean correlators, right? A Euclidean time dependent correlator, you know, it's just basically some exponential decaying functions of the of the energies right so we can tease those energies away out right from correlators but we can also in principle use time dependence of minkowski correlators right the challenge there right is that then you would have oscillatory functions but you know whatever we could do that um and so in principle you can you know do some analysis of time dependent uh, Mikasi correlators to, to extract the spectra, the same spectra, right? In principle, you can also get it from the energy dependence of Euclidean correlators. This is a more obscure object and not one that um, we actually consider, right? What we do on the lattice is these types of correlators. Um, this is more obscure, but in principle, we, we could do that. We can evaluate the moment the energy dependence of euclidean correlators why not um and and lastly of course we can get the the spectrum from the energy dependence of the minkowski correlators right the point is that oh you have a typo the point is that you know here they would just lie on the real axis here they would lie on the imaginary axis but so um, this is how we get the spectrum on the lattice, right? And what I'm going to do is, is actually consider this last one for understanding the spectrum. So I'm going to try, what I'm going to do is to sketch a derivation of the diagrammatic representation of Minkowski correlation functions uh, and look at the poles find the location of the poles and, and find the location of the poles is going to depend directly on the spectrum. That's going to be the punchline. So let's, let's jump into it. Um, yeah, I'm only going to say a word and then I'll, I'll stop. So, so first this, of course, this idea is by Martin Lusher, uh, in 1991. Um, and he has some preceding papers before that. Uh, he considered the simplest case where the particles were at rest and spinless. Um, 
these ideas had existed in the literature prior to Martin. Um, but what he did was he showed how to do this non perturbatively Okay. Um, but these, you know, the perturbative expressions existed long, long before. Then uh, um, Romakaina and Gottlieb generalized Martin's ideas for uh, where the system, so Martin assumed that the system was at rest, and these two came out and explained how to do this for uh, systems not at rest. Um, a somewhat more, um, a more generalizable form actually came 10 years later by Kim Sakrida and Sharp. Uh, in fact, I learned this from Steve Sharp, and and this paper actually, um, although the the results are exactly the same as as Gottlieb and Rumakainen, it, it it presents things in a way that is much more easily generalizable, and this has led to many generalizations of these ideas, and that's you know where I and others have contributed, and so this this paper turns out to be very useful and that's the one that I'm going to follow. Uh, and so the idea is to construct um, a diagrammatic representation of the two point function of the, the, the two particle correlators in a simple in a in the same constrained kinematic region that we're considering below the three particle threshold but above the two particle threshold. Okay. And uh, here, this looks exactly like the scattering amplitude, except I don't have extra null legs, okay? Meaning the kinds of diagrams that I have are the same, except I don't have extra null legs, right? Of course, I'm in a finite volume, which I wasn't before, but I just mean that the topologies of diagrams are exactly the same as the, um, as the ones in the scattering amplitude except for the lack of external legs. So I have some creation operator that creates my particles, they propagate, whoop, and then they annihilate with each other. And they're in a box. They can of course not just propagate, they can interact and then bounce with each other, right? Uh, and this object right here is none other than the beta superior kernel, right? Because it includes all the Diagrams except the X, X channel ones because I'm showing those explicitly. Okay, so instead of putting an S channel diagram here, well, look at it right here. It's right here, right? And the reason why I'm isolating the S channel diagrams is because just the same reason as before. It encodes, it has the singularities in the infinite volume amplitudes and the finite volume amplitudes that can have power law of finite volume effects. Okay. So these little guys, beta to be the kernels, just as before. And and remember, I just argued that the beta to be the kernel in this kinematic region, right, does not have intermediate particles going in shells. So it's it's a smooth, short distance, infinite volume quantity. Okay. And so this is just a bunch of bubbles, right? And so all I have to do is now think carefully about these kinds of bubbles. Uh, it could be a bubble that is sandwiching uh, the creation and annihilation operators, or it could be sandwiching an annihilation operator and the kernel. And so I'm just going to call this left, right. Some generic functions. I don't know what they are. Okay. And as I said, here you can have, you know, two particles going on shell. And so this can lead to finite volume effects that are ordered, you know, L to some power. So they're going to be power law. Um, I think I'm going to stop here. I'll just take a couple of steps in this derivation, then I'll stop because it's late in my time zone. So, oh, that's Chai, by the way. We got a guest. Chai, you want to say hi? He's a little shy. Okay, so um, the thing that I'm interested in is really the difference between the finite volume loops and the infinite volume loops, right? And so I'm just going to evaluate this loop 
and a finite volume, take the difference, okay? And I'm gonna skip some steps because we've already done this, the K0 integral before, right? I did it in one of the first lectures, and so let's just skip ahead. Uh, and so the K0 integral I can evaluate is gonna lead to a non-singular piece, right? If it's non-singular, the finite volume effects are gonna be exponentially small. So the difference between the finite volume non-singular function and the infinite volume non-singular function is exponentially small. I don't care about it, okay? So I'm ignoring it, right? So there's a bunch of dot, dot, dot here, which is just being dropped. All right, hopefully that makes some sense. So then the only piece that I'm keeping is the pole piece, which captures all the finite volume effects. Now, here's an, uh, another step, another thing that I'm gonna do. This L, right, depends, it's some function, but it depends on the magnitude of K, which is an internal momenta that is running. It's this guy, whoop. And the, and the, and the angle, right? Uh, this also depends on on the magnitude and angles, right? Uh, but when when I'm near the pole, k is fixed to be q, right? Remember q, I fix I define to be the on shell momenta. right, for identical particles, right, the momenta, the magnitude of the momenta in the center mass frame is fixed by the energy, right, same thing with non-identical particles, but when this, and when this, when K uh, uh, goes to Q, right, this, this has a pole, right, and so I can expand, basically what I can do is, uh, is, um, write I can write L K so I can write the L that appears as the one on shell plus the difference right and the point is that this as I approach this pole right this will approach it zero in such a way that the poles and the numerator are exactly going to cancel and so then that contribution is going to behave like this and so it's going to be it's going to be a finite function right and so i'm going to be integrating over a, a finite function a function that, that is non-singular and so that's going to lead to exponentially suppressed effects Okay, so then with this, we have, um, we have a, something that depends now the, the momenta, the magnitude of momenta has been placed on shell. And so the only non-trivial K dependence, right? Because Q now is independent of K. So I can in principle pull this out if it wasn't for the pesky angular dependence, right? Well, the angular dependence uh, we know we can write, we can treat with spherical harmonics, right? So I can write this as equal to the partial wave projected uh, amplitude of this function multiplied on spherical harmonics normalized by square root of four pi, right? And so this allows me to then pull out these angular projected uh, kernels and inside of it, what is left are the spherical harmonics. And I'm being I put 20 stars. So then this function encodes all the finite volume effects. It depends on the momenta, on the four momenta, sorry, and then the volume. One thing that is uh, important, right, is that if I just had the finite, the infinite volume loop, right, this would be Lorentz covariant, right, because the, the um, measure the Jacobi of the measure comes in with a factor of omega that, uh, you know, in such a way that this is covariant, right? 
but here I have a sum, and so this is uh, not Lorentz covariant. And so it depends on the four momentum, right? And this is what we expected, right? We expected that by doing calculations with different boosts, we would get different spectra, right? Because you're effectively Lorentz contracting your system along one direction, one preferred direction. So then the, uh, the spectrum, you know, there's no good reason why it would stay unchanged. Uh, and so this kind of looks like a finite volume, you know, cut. And so here, let me do, let me define it as such. So it just leads to a finite volume cut with IF inserted in it. So this is going to be equal to IL, IF, IR, right? And so, you know, where I've, uh, I've suppressed the indices, Oh, and I should say, I should have been more careful, right? This thing really depends on the spherical harmonics. So there's a matrix in LM space. Um, and this is important because, you know, the, if, I, if I, again, if I was an infinite volume, the, ang the angular piece, you know, the spherical harmonics are defined to be orthogonal to each other um, when you integrate over them, right? But if you're summing over them, they don't they don't have to be. And so this tells you that if you're in a finite volume, this is a manifestation of the fact that the spectrum, that the, uh, the different angular momentums will mix, but that's because they're not, a, you know, they're no longer a good quantum number. Instead, you have a reduced symmetry, a symmetry group, which if, if you're a rest, is a cubic group. Uh, if you're boosting, then it would be a little group of, a, of the cubic group. So it's just an explicit manifestation of that. Okay, so then let's delete this. And so now all we have to do is essentially just grab, basically what we have is this guy, right? And what we want is to then use his identity so that wherever we have finite volume loop, we just say, ah, this is equal to the infinite volume loop plus a finite volume cut. And so we're gonna apply this identity over and over again to our uh, correlation function and then repackage all the infinite volume quantities in terms of known infinite volume quantities uh, and then sum to our orders and uh, find the poles of the correlators. So that's where we're going. I think this is the perfect place to stop. So I'm gonna stop. Um, um, yep, I'm just gonna stop. <laughs> All right, well, hope you're having a good time and I'll talk to you next week.